unpack a few books, you'll find it real fast. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to conclude our series tonight. We're going to finish this up, Victory in Jesus. Uh, we have looked over a dozen or so topics uh, on ways that we can experience in our Christian lives victory in different areas or different arenas. And tonight we're going to kind of end with this, and maybe it kind of goes with a little bit what I said this morning, and it's a good challenge going from one year into the next. We're going to look at victory over a wounded spirit. Uh, whether that spirit has been hurt by someone whether that spirit has been hurt because of sin and God is chasing in us, uh, whether that spirit has been hurt uh, for whatever reason, uh, learning to deal with that. And, of course, there's one, there's one way to deal with it. We're going to see that tonight because it's all about this one thing. Um, uh, when we learn to deal with it properly, we can have victory over that. We can put those things aside, and uh, we can move on and press on for Christ. Uh, did everybody, first of all, get an outline that wants one? There are, there are extras at the back if you didn't get one. Thank you, Eddie, for passing those out. He was such a wonderful, wonderful servant of the Lord tonight. I appreciate that. He asked where they were, and I was like, oh, I forgot to put them out. And I gave him a stack. He said, you know, we passed those out. I said, yep. And he's like, all right, I'll do so he did He did that for us. Appreciate that. And uh, it's, good, it's good for Eddie to get around and meet people. Socialize them a little bit. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyways, Hebrews chapter 12, y'all find that? Yep. All right. We're going to read the first 16 verses tonight if you're able to stand with us uh, out of respect for God's word. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have it on the screen here for you as well. But uh, let's look at uh, starting verse number one. Familiar passage, most of it. Some of it maybe not as familiar, uh, but we're actually, as we go through the outline, we're going to pull through most of, of, of this uh, uh, chapter, these verses that we read. We're going to pull some thoughts from uh, the beginning, from the middle, and from the end of these verses that we read. And uh, so it'll all come, come together here. So look at verse number one. Wherefore, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. We'll come back to those words. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, amen, but grievous, I got the right verse up there? Okay, make sure we're following here. Nevertheless, after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby uh, many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And let's pray together and we'll be seated tonight. Father, we thank you tonight. Uh, for your love, thank you for your goodness, thank you for the service this morning, we thank you for uh, the people joining in, in uh, membership with our church, we thank you for soul saved this morning, Lord, we just thank you for all that you did, and uh, we thank you for tonight's service, Lord, the singing, the praise, uh, Lord, you truly are a good, remarkable, amazing, fantastic, wonderful God, 
And Lord, may we never lose sight of that. May we never stop to be thankful for it. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'll bless now the service tonight as we open the Word of God for the next few minutes and we conclude this series where we've seen many, many, many ways, many areas of, Lord, how to have victory in those things in our life. And as we close with this thought, Lord, it's a great challenge going into a new year. It's a great challenge in putting things in the past and moving forward with God. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless the preaching and the teaching this evening. May it help us, may it encourage us, and may it push us forward for Christ, we pray. We thank you again for this time. Now, bless the preaching. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Every four years, the Olympic Games are held uh, from around the world. Athletes come, and they have one thought. I want to win the gold medal. They do not train. They do not buffet their bodies. They do not uh, forego certain things. They do not focus solely on training and, and the sport that they're in for so long. They show up at the Olympics and say, I hope I get bronze. Okay. They have one goal in mind. I want to win the gold. Uh, the Christian life, uh, I don't have one goal in mind. Bob said it earlier. I want to win the gold. Amen. I, I want to be what I need to be for Christ. And I want him to be pleased with my life. And I want him to shine through me as a Christian. Uh, when we see the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat in the Olympics, uh, I, I think it's really kind of a microcosm for life and even for our Christian life. Uh, they show that people reaching, or, or they show how people react to difficulty. You ever seen somebody uh, lose and they're just so upset and they're so mad and they're so angry, and some lose and they're good sports about it, and you start to see how people respond to difficulty and adversity. You also see how people respond to triumph and glory. Uh, some, you know, they won and they're very humble about their winning, and I can't believe this. And some are like, yeah, hey, of course I should have won. I'm the best in the world, you know. You, you see all that, okay, in, in the Olympics. The writer of the book of Hebrews, whose name I will not mention, because whose name I do not know for sure, 100%, um, <laughs> uses a sports analogy to begin chapter 12 of this epistle. The cloud of witness he describes is like a cloud of spectators in a grand coliseum, those who have gone before us, and they're watching us now to see how a race will turn out. Every believer, whether we want to admit it or not or agree with it or not, every believer is running the race. Some are running slower, amen, <laughs> but as long as you're running, that's what's important, amen, and we continue to run that, that race. Many believers today, uh, as they run the race, you and I both know we're mature enough, it's a Sunday night crowd, as you run the race for Christ, you're going to find this out, people are going to hurt you, you're going to hurt people. <laughs> You're going to have disappointments. You're going to let people down. People are going to let you down. Uh, somebody's going to offend you. You're going to offend somebody. You're going to suffer at some point. The good news is this. If you have faltered or if you have fallen, if you have been injured, if you have been hurt, it doesn't matter. You can still recover from that and still run a good race. Just because you face that difficult time in your life does not mean the race is over. Amen? And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, sometimes when defeat and discouragement comes, it wounds our spirits. Uh, maybe it's a word somebody said to us, uh, maybe it was some, the way they responded, maybe the way they treated us, uh, maybe it was an unfair accusation, maybe again it was a chastening of the Lord, whatever it may be, and we have a way that our spirits sometimes feel, feel, feel hurt, feel wounded. Uh, we can overcome that. The Bible tells us we can triumph over a wounded spirit, and, and we actually have a formula here, very simple, uh, because it revolves around one particular thing. There's a lot of reasons you can get a wounded spirit. People is the big one, amen? People hurt you. <laughs> uh, and sometimes it's not intentional, but people hurt you. People fail you. People let you down. People break their promises. People don't do what you think they should have done, right? People can, can give you a wounded spirit. Again, the chastening of the Lord can wound your spirit. And even though we deserve the chastening, sometimes we get upset at God for, for dishing out the chastening, and it hurts our spirit. Uh, trials sometimes can wound our spirit. There's a variety of things in our lives that can, can cause this. We want to look at how do we deal with it. How do we get victory over it? And again, it's going to surround one thing. First, number one, look to the Savior. Everything, if we're going to get victory over wounded spirit, it's going to revolve around the example of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Look to the Savior. The best advice we can give if we've been injured or wounded or hurt is to change our focus. Look to the Lord Jesus 
Christ. The Bible says that in our passage, looking unto Jesus. You know what that means? It means taking our focus and attention away from everything else and putting it on him. Putting it on him. Uh, forget this, forget that, forget the circumstances. I'm going to focus on him. How many of you were runners in high school? Okay, these are all the not so smart people. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you put a ball in my hand, I'll run all day long. But I ain't going to get out and just run. That's, that's just dumb, all right? <laughs> but uh, here, here's what I do know because I wasn't one, but I know because I've talked to some and I've seen some and I've studied some. Um, runners in a race, you know what they're taught to focus on? The finish line. They don't focus on the other runners. They don't look over the shoulder and see how many, by the way, you've seen this. You've seen this in TV or on YouTube, okay, if, you, if you're into YouTube. You've seen that runner about to win, look over his shoulder, and it took just enough time if somebody passes him. They're, they're taught, they're trained to keep their focus on one thing, the finish line. Looking at other runners leads you astray. Hey, Christian, listen, looking at other things leads you astray. Looking at circumstances, looking at people, looking at trends, looking at religion. You fill in the blank. If our eyes are off Jesus, we'll be led astray. Jesus fed the 5,000. He sent the disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He stayed behind. Later that night, he met the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. A storm was brewing, remember? And, and, and uh, he met them on the Sea of Galilee. And, and they're being tossed, battered. And, battered. and Jesus came to them walking on the water, remember? Remember the story? They were afraid. When they saw him coming. Uh, they saw Jesus, John 6, 19. They were afraid. Peter, however, said, hey, if it's really you, let me get out and walk to you. Let me get out and walk on water, remember? By the way, <laughs> let me give you a sidebar. This is a free one, okay? Before we criticize Peter, which we do because he took his eyes off Jesus and sunk, at least Peter was bold enough to get out of the boat. Amen? Amen. So as we get comfy in the boat, we get relaxed in the boat, we're like, well, hey, this everything's going good. Hey, sometimes Jesus says, get out of the boat, man. I, I can't do anything if you won't step out onto the water. Peter gets out of the boat, right? And he starts walking the Savior. And what happens? As long as his eyes are focused on Christ, he's walking just like Jesus was on top of water. But as soon as he took his eyes off Christ and put them on the circumstances around him, what happened? Blub, 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 blub. <laughs> He started to sink. He started sinking. Jesus had to save him. Listen, no matter what pain is coming to your life, it may be a big deal to you. It may be great. It might be huge. You might say, Pastor, you don't understand. You're right. I may not understand. But if you'll look to the Savior as your strength and hope, you can have victory over that pain. You can have victory over that hurt. You can have victory over that person that wounded you. Look to the Savior. A couple things about the Savior I want to show you. First of all, uh, he is the originating one. He is the originating one. The Bible says that Jesus, in Hebrews 12, is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the beginning and the end of our faith. In reality, he's the beginning and the end of everything. Uh, he provides the basis of our faith. He is our eternal God. Uh, there, ever since... Uh, Years and years and years ago, some Arian heresy arose in the early church, and people started challenging the deity of Christ. Uh, Jesus did not become God. He has always and always will be God. We need to understand that. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, <laughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, he's always been God. Uh, his existence didn't begin at Bethlehem. That was his manhood, okay? That was his, uh, his, his man nature uh, began at Bethlehem. He did not begin as Jesus in Bethlehem. He's always been. He is the eternally existent Son of God. He was completely human when he came to Bethlehem, as well as completely divine. Think about it. John 11, what did he do at Lazarus' tomb? He wept before he called him out. He had human emotions. He understands the pain of losing a friend, Amen. He understands that. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be persecuted. He knows what it's like to have friends turn on you and betray you. He knows what it's like. I posted something on Facebook this week about how many pastors a year resign. 
due to many, a variety of many things, but most of the time it's burnout. In, in the end of that, that article that I posted, I don't know if you read it or not. If you want to go read it, go ahead. You don't have to. It wasn't sympathy. The, the end of the article was this. The pastor's greatest encouragement is you. Is you. Showing up. Participating, getting involved, loving the Lord, watching you grow, watching you bring your family up in the Lord. It's his greatest encouragement. But let me say this. Like Christ knew what it was like to lose a friend and have a friend betray him, the pastor knows that many times too. Pastors experience, and again, I'm not, I'm not asking for sympathy tonight. Get, don't get me wrong. I'm trying to explain tonight. Pastors experience somebody walking out of the church that has been there for 10 years without a word. What's wrong? Nothing. Where are you going? I don't know. What I do? Nothing. How can I help? Nothing. <laughs> and, and, and friends that you have for years, all of a sudden they're gone. And you know what it causes? Hurt. Pain. I've never met a shepherd who was a true shepherd, not a wolf in sheep's clothes. Amen. That lost a church member and said, well, I'm glad they're gone. Although there are a few he wishes would leave. I'm kidding. Even when they do, it hurts. Amen. <laughs> Christ knows what pain is like. He knows what betrayal is like. He knows what physical suffering is like. He ran the, the race before us, and that's why he says this. Look unto me. I've been there. I've done that. He's got the hat and the t-shirt. Amen. He's, he suffered it. He's been there. Uh, we will never be disappointed in dealing with hurt if we'll trust him, if we'll watch him. If we're looking, he's the originating. Secondly, he's the enduring one. He's the enduring one. The Bible says Jesus endured the cross. See, because he was God, he knew what the outcome of his race was going to be. He saw the joy of redemption through the sadness, the pain, and the suffering of the cross. Every trial and difficulty that he endured was done with an eye on things to come. You see, you and I look at today. How is this going to hurt me or affect me or change me or challenge me or, or be good for me today? And Jesus says, you know, I'm not looking at today. I'm going to do what I do today, endure the cross, because I see a million years down the road. Because I see people in years. I see people down the road in centuries. I see people down the road in decades that, that, that need me. And I've got to accomplish it. And I've got to finish his work that he sent me to do for them down the road. Uh, he, he bore the weight and penalty of our sins. Knowing the end result would be a good end result. It's a powerful testimony of the greatest love ever shown to man. The love of God. The love of Christ. He experienced pain. He could have freed himself. But he stayed there because he had a joy of a knowledge of things to come. He knew that people were going to accept him. The people that he came to seek and to save. Not all, but some would accept him. And he knew that. So he offered the gift of salvation. He had us on his mind. While he was on the cross. Think about that for just a minute. I know there's a song. And I know it's a cliche statement we make sometimes. But when he was on the cross. He was thinking about you. You say well I wasn't even born. He knew you would be. He knew you would be. He knows your name. He knows the hair is on your head. He takes care of you. He loves you. He formed you before you were in your mother's belly in her womb. He knew you. <laughs> and while he was enduring that, it was for us. He was watching us. Can I, just, can I just pause there for just a minute and say this? He endured all the persecution, all the pain, all the problems, all the suffering, all the agony because he saw us. Can I not just get over my petty problems? I mean, honestly, can I not as a Christian just say, you know what? <sighs> so they said something that offended me. Get over it. They didn't drive nails through my hands. Shake it off. Amen? Shake it off. Let's go back to that sermon next week, all right? We'll preach it again. <laughs> Serious. Can we not be more forgiving and more gracious? He's the enduring one. If we're going to look to him as the Savior, as the pattern, as our ensample, as the Bible says, if we're going to look at it, we've got to look at it in this area as well, dealing with hurt. Thirdly, he's the resurrected one. You know, I'm so thankful that when he died and he suffered and he took my penalty and he paid my payment on the cross, I'm so thankful he didn't stay in the grave. Amen? Amen. He's the resurrected one. The Bible says in our scripture that he is set down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. He didn't stay on the cross. By the way, I'm just going to say this. You can get mad at me if you want. You can throw a stone at me. You can disagree with me if you want. That's why I don't like the crucifix. Amen. That's good. He ain't on the cross anymore. <laughs> okay? Now, if you have one, I'm not going to tell you you're going to hell. If you have one, I'm not going to come to your house and rip it down. I'm not going to scream and yell at you. He ain't on the cross. Nor is he in the tomb. Neither one. Neither one. Uh, he, he didn't stay in the cross. He didn't stay in the tomb. He was dead. He's risen. He's alive forevermore. The fact that Jesus reached heaven is symbolic of the fact he finished his work. He finished his work. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. That also symbolizes that the Father accepted the sacrifice. Nothing else has to be done to have our sins forgiven. Everything that is needed was completed that day. And on John 19, 30, Jesus said three words. It is finished. He did not say it is almost finished. There's a little bit more to do. It will about to be finished. He said it is finished. It is finished. The resurrection of Christ gives us hope for the future. Amen. Uh, when I'm knocked down, when I'm injured, when I'm hurt, I realign my sight back to Jesus. I realize where he came from. I realize what he endured. I realize his resurrection. And I realize this. He knows the pain I'm feeling. And many men will disappoint us. But I thank God that Jesus never fails. Jesus never lets us down. He died. He rose again for our salvation to give us victory over a wounded spirit. Look to the Savior. That's the first step. That's the first step. The second step includes the same person. Listen to the Savior. Listen to the Savior. You realize that many times the difficult times we go through, God uses those times to teach us more than any other time. It's important to remember not all the problems we experience are chastening because of sin. Uh, you remember in the Bible when uh, Jesus uh, was going to heal the blind man? And they asked Jesus, why is he blind? Was it his sins or his parents' sins? It was neither. It was so God could be glorified. Not every bit of chastening that you go through in life is because you're a wicked, rotten sinner and God's getting you. Okay? So by the way, let me just say this, Christian. Let's, let's encourage one another. Instead of when we're going through difficult times saying, man, I wonder what kind of sin God's punishing. Let, let's put that out of our mind, okay? Because sometimes God is using that, that, that chastisement or that trial or whatever in our lives to teach us and to grow us, and to shape us and to mold us. It's important to remember that some trials are simply a result that we live in a sinful world. We live in a fallen world. But our trials can bring God glory if handled properly. Um, lady was talking about the hospital stay the other day. Nobody enjoys staying in the hospital. Nobody. I mean, unless you're just crazy. We don't enjoy a hospital trip. Besides the constant in and out, in and out, in and out, buzzer, 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 the food is horrible. You know, nobody enjoys staying at the hospital. But you can go into the hospital and you can look at it two ways. I'm going to complain, I'm going to gripe, I'm going to be bitter, I'm going to be upset, I'm going to take it out on my nurses. Or, hey, I'm going to try to show God's glory while I'm here. I'm going to try to represent Christ while I'm here. I'm going to try to be the best example I can be while I'm here and not enjoy the situation I'm in. Sometimes trials and problems and hurt and troubles uh, are a direct result of something we've done. Sometimes they're not. Uh, but, but think about this. If our problems and our trials and our wounded spirit comes because God is chastening us, remember a couple things. Remember this. If he is chasing you, first of all, remember, that means you're his child. That means you're his child. That's an evidence or a proof of salvation. God chastens you. Uh, if you're not chastened, Hebrews tells us, you ain't part of the family of God. Because <laughs> when you do wrong, he's going to take you to the woodshed. It may not be immediate. It may not be like you think he should or how you think he's going to. But God always punishes sin. One way, one sometime, God punishes sin. Uh, chastening is not popular to be taught about. It's not a fun subject to preach on. It's probably not politically correct, okay? But throw that away because it's biblical. It's doctrinal. It's truthful. It's in the Word of God. Uh, it's Bible truth. God loves you so much when you do wrong, He will chasten you. That's pretty awesome if you think about it. Uh, he wants us to be right with Him. He'll do what's necessary to bring us back to Him. 
Yet some people, when they're chasing, get bitter and go even farther away from God. Uh, that's not the correct spo- response to suffering or chastening, okay? Listen to the Savior. Let me give you a couple thoughts. First of all, listen to his chastening. When it's happening in our life, instead of rebellion, the Bible uses the word despise. Instead of rebellion or giving up, the Bible says don't faint when you're chasing. Don't quit. Uh, instead of that, heed to the admonition that you're receiving. If God is chastening us, there's a reason for it. Listen to it. Listen to it. Every parent knows children need discipline. Am I right? Now, they <laughs> they don't enjoy discipline, but just like you know they need it, they know they need it. It's structure. Structure. Somebody said one time, um, there's uh, uh, um, I gotta find where I was at. There's um, there's three ways to get things done. Do it yourself. Ask someone else to do it, or tell your children not to. <laughs> and unfortunately, sometimes that's true. But you know what Scripture teaches? And I'm just, I'm just gonna be real with you. I know something in the crowd. So, and, and you're all grown. Most of your kids are probably all grown, and maybe you're working with grandkids even now. Scripture teaches pretty plainly this: if you don't discipline your children, you don't love them the way you ought to. That's what Scripture teaches. It's not a mean thing. It's not a vindict. I have the rule over my children. I'll beat them. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, Disciplining of the children is a biblical principle. And it shows them we love them just like God says, I chasten you because I love you. I love you. Uh, God loves us so much. He's not going to let us get by in sin. He's going to correct us. He's going to correct us because he wants us in that right relationship with him. Don't give up. Don't be faint. When the Lord chastens, don't get upset at him. We need it. We need it. Uh, the Lord chastens us. Uh, when we, when uh, we do something we shouldn't do, the Lord might chasten us. When we're not doing something we should do, the Lord might chasten us. It's a sign of his love for us. God only chastens his children. Now, let's put this into parental perspective. There have been times I've had neighbors or family that I sure would love to beat the tar out of their child. Y'all with me? But I can't because they're not my kid. I can beat the tar on my kid. Just be, be peace. Okay, I'm not, I'm not literally, I'm not condoning um, child abuse, okay? I'm joking. I discipline my child, not yours. Does that make sense? Same thing with God. He disciplines his children. And by the way, this is what Oprah needs to learn. We're not all God's children. We're his creation. But you're only a child when you join the family, amen? And then that's when chastening comes because God loves us. Listen to his chastening. Secondly, learn from his chastening. If he's going to do it because he loves us, he's going to teach us something. Hebrews says that this chastening that he provides in our life, listen to what it says. It said it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Just as a gardener prunes a fruit tree to make it more productive, and he might have to cut back some branches, and you're like, oh, that tree looks ugly now. He's doing it for future fruit, for future growth. God uses chastening as a means to remove things from our life and teach us his purposes and plans to add to our life for future growth. Chasing is not fun. It's not pleasant. And it's only valuable if you listen to it and allow it to affect change in your life. The chastening of the Lord. Uh, that's God's purpose. Rather than allow our, wound, or our spirits to become wounded by chastening, let's say, listen, God, I'm listening. What are you showing me through this? What are you teaching me? What are you training me? And where are you growing me? Show me, Lord. Uh, listen to the Savior. The third one is this. We look to the Savior. We listen to the Savior. And then thirdly, we learn of the Savior. We learn of the Savior. As Jesus endured the pain of the cross, it teaches us that even in my own life, though I'll never face anything that difficult, I can have victory over hurt, over pain. Uh, following his pattern of suffering teaches us I can avoid the snare of bitterness uh, that captures so many people when trouble comes. Uh, Jesus was nailed to the cross. And you know what? He didn't rail against the soldiers that put him there. Uh, he, 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 he didn't call 10,000 angels. 
He didn't turn to the thief on the cross that rejected him and say, fine, die and go to hell. He didn't uh, call down thunder from those that were there uh, rallying against him and blaspheming him. He said, Father, forgive them. He understood the purpose of his life. Here's the thing. The more we learn about Jesus, the better equipped we are to fulfill God's plan for our life. The more we learn. Uh, That's why Jesus told his disciples, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. As we learn of Jesus, we gain the strength to endure and overcome trials, heartaches, problems, burdens, chastening, and wounded spirits. Give me a couple of things about the Savior here. First of all, follow his peace. Follow his peace. In the midst of suffering, Jesus had peace. You realize in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was taken to be taken to a mock trial <laughs> by a mock group of people for mock crimes that he didn't commit. You, you realize he never panicked? He never turned around and said, oh, who's going to save me, disciples? Peter, draw your sword. He didn't struggle with that. He had peace. When he's on the cross and people were blaspheming and beard had been ripped and plucked and the stripes had been applied and, and all the pain that he had endured, people still laughing and jeering. He didn't. Oh, oh my God. He had peace. We have to learn the peace of Christ to have uh, freedom from our, from our pain of past hurts. If Jesus could have peace on the cross, can we not have peace in our lives? <laughs> yeah. God says, follow peace. Hebrews 12, 14, even after others have wounded us. If we're trying to get even, you'll never overcome the wounds of the past. Peace comes when we look to Jesus instead of our pain. Jesus said this in in John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have the Savior's promise of his peace. That same peace that helped him to endure the cross is the peace that passes all understanding that we can have. i got to learn from the Savior. Follow his peace. How about this? How about about follow his holiness? Follow his holiness. The purpose of trial many times is purging. The purpose of purging many times is to help us strive for holiness. If sin brings chastening into our lives, uh, we have to learn to hate and forsake the sin and learn from the chastening to follow holiness. Uh, when we realize that, I don't want to return to the sin again because I don't enjoy the chastening. I want to keep t- continue to strive for holiness. Suffering allows us the opportunity to be more like Jesus. It really does. I don't enjoy it, but it helps me be more like Christ. Holiness defines uh, the characteristic of God. It defines the characteristic of God. You remember Isaiah? I think it was in chapter 6 or so when he had the vision of God. And uh, one of the things he saw was the seraphims flying around the throne. And, and as they were talking about God, he said, One cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy. God could have had those angels announce any one of his innumerable characteristics or traits. And he chose one for them to announce his holiness. The one that was emphasized by the angels of heaven was his holiness. Christian, listen. If I'm going to get victory over a wounded spirit or chastening from, or people, whatever the, whatever the cause may be, I have to follow his peace, but I also have to follow and strive for his holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Strive for, for, for holiness. Last thought. Think, think, think about this one. If we're going to learn from the Savior, I've got to forsake all bitterness. I gotta forsake all bitterness. God's grace will never fail us, but we can fail his grace if we allow wounds to make us bitter. Two things that I know of as they grow are nursed children and animals. If you nurse a grudge, it will never get better. Kids need nursing. Animals can use nursing you know, to, to grow and to help them get better. Grudges don't work that way. Holding on to a grudge or an injury or, or anything like that infects us with the bitterness of poison or the poison of bitterness. The root of bitterness is like an infection. The worst thing is this. That infection is never, and I'm just going to say that word never. It's hard to say that word for a lot of things. The, 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 that 
infection, that poison of bitterness, it never just affects my life. Never. It always affects my family, my friends, those that I'm close to, my church, you fill in the blank. It spreads. Let the hurt go. See, pastor, you, you keep saying that. You say this all the time. We're going to have to keep saying it until God calls us home because we still struggle with it. But let it go. Let it go. When Jesus was about to die, Luke 23, 34, he said, Father, forgive them. He let it go. Nothing anyone does to us could be worse than what they did to Jesus. Let it go. Let it go. Jesus told a parable, if you'll remember, of a servant who owed an enormous debt to the king. And the king called in the debt, remember? The servant said, man, I don't have it. The king said, cast him into prison. Cast his family into prison. Do whatever it takes till I get my money back. Remember the servant? Oh, please, 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 I beg you, I implore you, please don't do that, don't do it. Remember the king had mercy and said, fine, I'll forgive the debt. Do you remember? And then the servant leaves the castle, leaves the, the throne room, heads out on his journey towards home, and he finds a friend, a guy that owes him a little bit of money. And he says, hey, dude, you remember I bought you McDonald's the other day? You owe me six bucks. Wait a minute. If it's that, you, nine bucks. we got to account for inflation. You owe me nine bucks. <laughs> and the guy says, man, I don't have it. And remember the Bible says he grabbed him by the throat and demanded that money to be paid. Rather than to repeat the grace that he had been shown by the king and extended to him, he insisted on getting even. Can I, can I just ask this question? Don't, don't answer out loud, but you got somebody by the throat tonight? Because I hate to say it, it's a problem in our churches today. This isn't, this isn't just the world. It's a problem in our churches today. We got somebody by the throat, and we are not going to let go until we get even. I want to challenge you tonight. Listen. You, you want to get victory over the wounded spirit that you're carrying around? You got to forsake the bitterness. You, you got to let go of the bitterness. Uh, whatever insult or injury that's happened, I will never become better until I get rid of the bitter. Well, that's a good, we got to put that on a t-shirt. You'll never get better till you get rid of the bitter. <laughs> never, never. It's been said that if a rattlesnake gets cornered, and agitated enough, it'll bite himself. I wish every rattlesnake would do that. Amen. <laughs> do you realize this is exactly what harboring bitterness is? It's like a rattlesnake backed into a corner that's going to bite himself. Because the poison only it, it affects us, not the person we're holding a grudge against. Not the person that we're bitter towards. It fills us with the venom of bitterness. I'll ask you tonight. I'm, I'm going to close and I'm done. Is there somebody maybe at the beginning of this year that we need to forgive? There's no victory over a wounded spirit if we haven't forgive, forgiven those that have hurt us. There's no victory over a wounded spirit if we're upset at God for chastening us. He brought into our lives chastening to purify us from sin. Lay aside the pain of the past. Uh, I want the fruitful, productive life that he has for me. But I can't get that with the wounded spirit that I'm carrying around. I'll never know a better day than when I release the pain of the past and I give up the bitterness towards that person that hurt me. You know, God does not intend for you to go through your life carrying that pain, carrying that problem. He teaches over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture. Let it go. Move on. Have victory over a wounded spirit. How? Look to the Savior, listen to the Savior, and learn from the Savior. He's our greatest example of this. And if we can apply those truths, guess what? That wounded spirit can be taken care of pretty quickly. And we can move forward for that productive life that he has for us. But we got to get victory over the wounded spirit. Um, that's the last lesson I prepared for victory in Jesus. Okay, We're getting ready to go into missions month in just a few weeks. So I'm not going to start another series and then break from it for four weeks and go back to it. Because... If you're like me, I would forget forget the first ones. You know, I wouldn't even remember what happened. Okay, so uh, so we'll have a different uh, different things going on over the next few Sunday nights. But um, that's the last one in that series. But I hope 
a dozen or 13 or 14 or however many lessons that we had. I hope that we can go away from this series thinking this. No matter what the situation is, whether we covered it or not, I can have victory because of who he is. I can have victory because of Christ who dwells in me. See, there's nothing, there's no battle too great for Christ. Amen. I can have victory through Jesus. And I hope, I hope that we learned that through these weeks and these months. Uh, how to have victory in Jesus through these areas. Uh, we get all our blanks filled in tonight. Let me ask you that first. Yes? Any questions? Comments? Thoughts? Who's ready for some ice cream? Three people. All right. I'll meet you at uh, I don't know, any place that's open. <laughs> Anyways, amen. Let's strive this year to move forward with God and experience victory in Jesus. Uh, and the combination will be wonderful, won't it? Amen. Amen. Let's look, Lord, in prayer and ask his blessing as we're dismissed. Father, we thank you tonight for loving us. We thank you, uh, Lord, that we can have victory. We thank you that you make it possible and you teach us in Scripture how to have victory over these areas we've been talking about. Lord, I pray that we will claim these truths. I pray that we'll be victorious uh, Christians, that we'll enjoy life, that we'll be fruit-bearing, productive Christians because we have victory uh, even over this last topic of a wounded spirit, Lord. Help us to put all bitterness beside, to not hold grudges, Lord, to put the past in the past and leave it there. Help us, Lord, to follow your pattern, to keep our eyes on you and to focus our attention on Christ. That sure will help us to gain victory. Father, we ask you tonight as, as we go to our homes, we ask for safety, please, as we travel. Uh, we ask you to bring us back on Wednesday for our service. We ask you, Lord, this week, help us to live for you. And like Bob so eloquently put it earlier, Lord, may we glow for Christ. And may you be seen in our lives as we just live. And may we point people to the Savior, Lord, I pray. Uh, help us to, uh, to please you with our lives and do what you'd ask us to do, Lord, I ask. Uh, Father, we thank you again for the time we've had to be together tonight. We pray that you again, you'll dismiss us safely and bring us back again on Wednesday. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If I, God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out and look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday.